have this morning four papers that will be presented um, uh, by authors that are also online and here to answer your questions if you have any. Please post them on the uh, chat of the YouTube session or on the Discord. The first paper will be on prefilters for sharp image display and will be presented by Luis Claudio uh, Govela Rocha, Manuel Oliveira, and Eduardo Gastal. Present our work on prefilters for sharp image display. When we look at the digital picture, we are not seeing an exact representation of what was photographed. This is due to the intrinsic difference between entities on the real world, which are continuous, and their digital representation. When this guy takes a digital picture, there are three images involved. First, a continuous image reaching the camera lens. Second, the digital image acquired by the camera. And third, a continuous image formed on the retina of the observer when looking at the display. In this work, we explore how to make images 1 and 3 as close as possible. Let's take a look at this process. If we start with a continuous image F, common wisdom tells us that in order to display it, we first need to prefilter it to avoid aliasing, and then sample. We'll call this the sampling step. However, when it comes to reconstruction of the samples, we do not have that much control. An LCD display reconstructs a continuous image from the samples using a box-like interpolation. This image will pass through your eye lens and then will be projected on the retina, resulting in a slightly blurry version of the continuous image generated by the display. Therefore, we could say that the final image we see is the result of prefiltering a continuous image followed by sampling and then reconstruction using blurred boxes. How can you guarantee that a reconstructed image on the retina is the closest we can get to the original one? Moreover, how can you guarantee this given that we have little control of the shape of the display pixels and even less on the point spread function of the eye? The answer is that the prefilter should pre-correct for the blur which will happen in the display and eye reconstruction. More specifically, we want to modify the samples so that the PSF blurred display reconstruction is as close as possible to the original image. Based on this idea, we present a prefilter that takes into account both the display and the observer's PSF. Our prefilter takes two intuitive parameters, the viewing distance and display pixel density. Its implementation is very efficient with linear time complexity on the number of pixels. Here's an image rendered using our prefilter for a viewing distance of 40 cm on a 100 ppi display, which are the default parameters we recommend for general use. Compared to the traditional and widely used tent kernel on the right, our result is much sharper and at virtually no computational overhead. While the images generated by our prefilter are optimized to be viewed at their original size, in this presentation, we will highlight some details using upscaled insets as shown here in orange. Our prefilter also compares favorably against state-of-the-art reconstruction filters, such as the optimized quasi-interpolator on the far right. We are not the first ones to pre-correct images for display reconstruction. Kajia and Ulner modeled the pixel of a CRT monitor as a Gaussian function and then asked what are the optimum weights to linearly combine the Gaussian kernels to approximate the original signal. Here's an example of the results they obtain. When prefiltering and sampling a continuous image naively with a tent filter, the image displayed on a monitor was excessively blurry. Their optimal prefiltering, shown on the right, produced an image where borders are better defined. Our work extends the technique of Kajia and Ulner. We answer the same question, but we also account for the point spread function of the viewer, viewing distance and display density. Furthermore, we use modern sampling theory to easily adapt to different reconstruction models. Please refer to our paper for a deeper look at related works. Let's see how our prefilter is modeled. 
Recall the reconstruction step we showed previously, composed first by the display reconstruction and then the retinal projection blurred by the eye's optical system. We will start by modeling those two processes. A pixel of an LCD monitor may be reasonably approximated by a box kernel. While this is a rough approximation, it is sufficient for our purposes. For typical viewing distances, the eye's point spread function will dominate over the pixel shape. Regarding subpixels, displaced sampling techniques may also be employed with our prefilter, as discussed in the paper. We now focus on the eye's point spread function. While the image we perceive is a combination of physical and nonlinear neural effects, we model the eye simply as a camera with a lens. This is enough to capture the low passing behavior of human vision and is experimentally valid for pupils up to 3 mm in size, which is typical for subjects looking at backlit screens. A camera with a small circular aperture and perfectly focused has an airy disk as a point spread function. For efficiency and simplicity, we approximate it by a scaled quadratic piece spline. This approximation is also valid in 2D as shown here. Finally, the relative scale of the PSF depends on viewing distance. Putting it all together, if we consider the display pixel model combined with the viewer's point spread function for some viewing setup, shown here in 1D, we obtain our final display plus I reconstruction model. In our paper, we describe a physical experiment on how to estimate the PSF's exact size in pixel units. Note that while the PSF has a constant size on the retina, its scale relative to the projected retinal image varies with viewing distance. As such, the display plus I reconstruction kernel will also vary. This graph shows the expected shape of the kernels as predicted by our model for several viewing distances. With this model at hand, one can now ask what is the optimum set of samples that generates the best reconstruction? We choose to model this problem by minimizing the L2 distance between the input image F and its reconstruction F tilt, which is obtained by reconstructing the samples with the display plus I reconstruction kernel. The resulting metric is perceptual since it takes into account the viewing conditions. This problem is well studied and has a linear closed form solution easily derived through generalized sampling theory. This uniquely defines the optimum prefilter that should be used before sampling the input image F. Here's what our optimum prefilter looks like for a viewing distance of 40 cm on a 100 ppi display. Furthermore, this prefilter is efficiently implemented as it can be decomposed as a combination of a compact polynomial kernel and a recursive digital filter. Before we analyze the frequency response of our prefilter, let's see a practical example. Given a continuous input image, traditional prefiltering will remove high frequencies to avoid aliasing. The filtered image is sampled, resulting in digital samples. Passing the resulting samples through our display plus I reconstruction model, one can simulate the resulting perceived image. Now, we process the same input with our prefilter, parameterized by the viewing conditions. As one can see, the resulting image has much more contrast. Furthermore, after sampling and reconstruction, the perceived image is much sharper. It is also closer to ground truth, as can be seen here. We look at the very same process on the Fourier domain. Given an input signal composed of two cosine components, we show its amplitude spectrum on the bottom. To digitally represent this continuous input, we first prefilter it with some anti-aliasing kernel. This is followed by sampling, resulting in a discrete set of samples. To recover the continuous input from the samples, we apply the reconstruction kernel. Notice that the display plus I reconstruction has a low passing effect. Thus, 
the final perceived signal has severe attenuation of the highest frequencies. Our prefuter, however, has the effect of enhancing high frequencies prior to sampling. As such, it compensates for the attenuation that follows from reconstruction. As we can see, the spectrum of the perceived signal prefiltered with our technique is much closer to the input signal. Also notice that any anti-aliasing filter other than sync would attenuate high frequencies even more. We efficiently implement our prefilter using the tools from generalized sampling theory. While Shannon sampling theory deals with exact reconstruction of band-limited functions, generalized sampling deals with optimal approximation of square integrable functions on an L2 sense. Since our display plus I reconstruction model is expressed as a square integrable kernel, we use generalized sampling to obtain the optimal prefilters. For continuous input signals, the digital samples to be shown on the display are then obtained by convolution with the optimal prefilter, followed by sampling. However, this is computationally inefficient since the optimal prefilter has an infinite impulse response. What generalized sampling tells us is that this operation is equivalent to and more efficiently implemented by, instead, prefiltering the continuous signal using the reconstruction kernel followed by convolving the resulting samples with a discrete filter we'll call Q. This is efficient because the reconstruction kernel is a compact piecewise polynomial, and the discrete filter may be applied as a separable recursive filter, which has linear time complexity on the number of pixels. Q is obtained from the sampled autocorrelation of the reconstruction kernel. Together, these operations efficiently compute the digital samples to be shown on the display to optimally approximate the original continuous signal. This is the process we employ for Monte Carlo rendering with our prefilter, where the input continuous signal is known, and also to image downscaling, where the high resolution input image is effectively continuous from the point of view of the downscale domain. For another application of our prefilter, which we call image enhancement, the input signal has already been prefiltered and sampled with another known kernel. In this case, the digital image samples to be shown on the display are obtained by filtering the discrete input with our discrete enhancement filter P, which is uniquely defined from the sampled correlation of our display plus I reconstruction kernel with a known other prefilter. This idea is applicable to enhancing pre-rendered Monte Carlo images, but also to enhancing digital images in general. Now let's see some results. This image has been rendered using our prefilter using the parameters we recommend for general use. Compared to the optimized quasi-interpolator, a state-of-the-art reconstruction filter, and other classical options, notice how the carvings are sharper in our result. For image downscaling, we recall that our examples are meant to be viewed in the original resolution at the target viewing conditions. We upscale them here for better visualization of the filtering effects. Our prefilter on the left is able to generate a sharper and more detailed result. In particular, the intentional halo around edges provides sharpness when the image is viewed at the proper resolution and distance. Existing nonlinear filters are also able to produce detailed results, but lack this enhancing halo effect. Furthermore, they are also more prone to aliasing. Here's another image downscaling example, this time including a larger variety of techniques. The downscaled image generated by our prefilter has the sharpest details. Notice that our image has more contrast in the edges, which helps the perception of sharpness.
let us now see some examples of pre-rendered image enhancement. For these examples, we do not need to modify the rendering software. Instead, we only post-process the original tent filtered images. In this first example, we have a scene with lots of fine details on textures, which are sharpened by applying our recursive enhancement filter. On the chair, Notice the enhancement in the wood texture. Again, this scene was rendered using a tent kernel and enhanced with our technique. Notice how borders are sharper. We now show an example of enhancing a digital photograph with our technique. For this, we assume that the original samples were obtained using a box prefilter. Compared to the original input, our technique enhances the detailed roughness of the wall and the rooftop. We applied our technique with default parameters and no fine tuning. In contrast, unsharp masking requires manual tuning to achieve its best result. As a last example, we will see how the viewing distance affects the image. On the left, we have the original image, and on the middle, our optimized version for a viewing distance of 80 cm. We remind you that these images should be viewed on their native resolution and at the actual viewing conditions. Here, we will downscale them in order to simulate the viewing distance. Compared to the original image, notice how fine details like the eyes are sharper in our enhanced image. At even larger viewing distances, our prefilter is still able to produce sharp details. By comparing the images with the same size, we see that our prefilter produces intentional halos that provide sharpness at the desired viewing distance. As we get farther, the halos get larger, as shown here, for a distance of 400 cm. In summary, we presented a prefilter that accounts for the display plus eye reconstruction. It has an efficient implementation and only a few intuitive parameters, the viewing distance and display pixel density. It is able to generate sharp images for display, and its applications include, but are not limited to, image enhancement, image downscaling, and Monte Carlo rendering. We invite the viewer to see our paper for a detailed frequency analysis, and also a discussion on variations of our prefilter for controlling the trade-off between aliasing, ringing, and blurring. We'd like to thank these individuals and institutions who provided funding. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. So the first question uh, is from Derek Bradley. He asked if it's... Um, uh, sorry, that it, as he understood, uh, the idea is to make the displayed image as close as possible to the input signal. Uh, but it's, you also model the viewer's PSF of the eye. Um, so it seems wrong as the real world input will also pass through the eye. So you should not have the eye as part of your model. So would the goal uh, be to make the displayed image as close as possible to the input signal um, and let both the real input and the image input go through the eye as a black box. So the question is about um, uh, clarifying this point, please. Yes, yeah, so I think I can answer this, this first one. That's a good question. So uh, ideally we want the, the ground truth image with no pre-filtering at all from the eye to be as close as possible to the to the image that is reaching your 
retina, right? So yes, if, if you're looking at a, a real continuous image, let's say it's being processed by your uh, eye's optical system, but we want the image that's reaching your sensor, your, your retina, to actually be as close as possible to the ground truth image with no pre-filtering at all. So that ideally that we make the image that you're seeing um, a much better representation of the true image that exists. Not sure if that's that's clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a second question is from Graham Philipson uh, from the BBC, uh, and he said that it's hard to know PPI and viewing distance in real world situation, except for uh, VR video, which could maybe benefit nicely from this. Would this be naively applied there, or would it need to be expanded to also model the optics of each different headset? Uh, I think I can answer this one. So I'm not really uh, acquainted with VR uh, displays, but as far as I know, a VR headset still is a, a sort of LCD display with some uh, lenses. So yeah. Uh, a, priori, a priori, you could like uh, model the model apply, apply our technique naively because you you can see this setup as a as an LCD display which is really close to your eyes uh, with very tiny pixels. So yeah, you could apply it naively, but also um, I'm aware that there's a lot of lenses and optical systems on the on the headset itself so it would be better if you could model this and uh, as long as you can model all this process uh, process all this optics of the headset as a linear filter uh, the method is essentially the same you, you just be uh, using a different um, a different reconstruction kernel I um, don't know if this is answering the question. Th thank you very much. Um, you. I will I will take time for one question I have, if you don't mind. Um, I was wondering how sensitive it would be uh, your filtering to wavelengths, to color channels, and also to uh, motion, to uh, the time c consistency. So. So about motion, we, we applied our pre-filter to, to a video. We have some results and it seems to, to work nicely. Uh, of course, it's as we saw in the presentation, it tries to enhance some frequencies before, uh, before sampling. So if, if during the motion you have uh, frequency variations in the video, it may be that some frames will be more enhanced than others, especially if you have some motion blur. And uh, sorry, the first part of your question was about color channels. Yes, exactly. Is it sensitive to that? Did you find differences? We we didn't model, we maybe can talk more about this, but we didn't model the, the difference in in perception for different color channels. But you, you could apply it to, to, you know, to, to subpixel rendering, just like some other pre filters just doing displaced uh, displaced convolutions, for example. Okay, thank you. thank you very much for your answers, and uh, congratulations to your good, very good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we we're gonna uh, now pass to the next paper. Um, it's on RGB two AO ambient occlusion generation from RGB images. It is presented by Naoto Inoue, who is with us today, uh, Daishi Itao, Yannick Oljofra, Long Mei, Brian Price, and Toshiko Yamazaki. Hello, my name is Naoto Inoue. I'm a PhD student at the University of Tokyo, Japan. Today, I'm going to present our paper, LGB2AO, ambient occlusion generation from RGB images. This is a joint work with Adobe Research. In this paper, we propose a novel image filter. 
given a single RGB image of a model based on a convolutional neural network generates ambient occlusion, or AO for short, uh, which we visualize as a grayscale image. Using the generated AO, we can darken the enclosed and disheltered areas like those below the car. We can manually control the strength of the AO as shown in the animated result. We demonstrate two applications of generated AO. The first one is realistic 2D image composition. So simply pasting an object onto a background image would look as if the object is floating in midair in the image. Adding AO around the inserted object would make the composite visually pleasing. The second one is geometry aware contrast enhancement. So it can be used to emphasize the geometry in a photograph, providing a user control on perceivable depth. Here we're going to briefly review related works in 3D. First, AO itself is not an idea we propose, but the idea which is first developed about 20 years ago and has been investigated for a long time in computer graphics. Formally, AO indicates the amount of ambient light reaching every point in a scene. So with AO, we can add a non-directional shading effect in rendering a 3D scene like the figures below. With ambient light, all objects in the scene are usually brightened with a fixed intensity and color. However, if the light is occluded by surrounding objects or stuff, it decreases. AO has been a simple yet effective global illumination model for real-time rendering and implemented in a lot of commercial softwares. However, all the prior works requires accurate 3D geometry information, such as depth buffer, and thus are not, the, not suitable for our setting. In contrast, we want to compute AO from a single RGB image input. Here, we briefly review several related works. Professional artists working with 2D content have also developed creative techniques leveraging AO-like information to enhance the realism and the impression of their artworks, such as photographs, painting, and illustrations. For example, given a base color illustration, an artist manually draw light and AO layer and merge them to create a fine-looking result. However, it requires significant effort and time for users. Thus, we are interested in fast and automatic approximation of such procedure. One may wonder, using a well-known image contrast filter, which increases or decreases difference in brightness. However, it's different. Manipulating contrast changes an image globally, as we can see in this figure. Increasing the contrast makes light areas much lighter and dark areas much darker in a whole image. We discuss another related topic to make image composition look realistic. In outdoor or indoor lighting estimation, given an image for background, some parameters representing 3D lighting environments such as HDR environment map are estimated. Using the estimated lighting model, we can render new 3D object with known geometry and material realistically as shown in the live video. However, this is for 3D object compositing and it's not applicable to our setting. The second one is an approach called image harmonization. For example, in the most recent approach, deep image harmonization, Given a 2D composited image and mask for the foreground, the foreground region is changed to match the appearance of the background. DAH achieves this by training our CNN on pairs of harmonized and non-harmonized image. However, it doesn't change outside the mask region, so we believe this is orthogonal to our RGB2AO. 
since now we have finished discussing the related works, we explain our approach. We think that we can compute AO from a single RGB image. For example, given an image and zoom of it like this. So we can easily see that there are subtle edges visible between the walls and the floor. So there should be an AO effect around this area. And if if you manually draw it, the effect is like this. So we learn to combine such cues and generate AO by supervised learning. Before going into the details of our model to generate AO, we introduce some notations. Formally speaking, the input is a three-dimensional image X and the output is a one-dimensional grayscale image Y. All the values in the both image are between zero and one. In addition, at test time, we introduce a scalar variable A for controlling the strengths of AO effect and finally produce X dash in which AO effect is applied. Unless specified, we show the AO magnified result by setting A equal 1.0. Our baseline is pix to pix HD, which is a well-known method using CNN for image to image translation. In this model, a network called generator which learns the mapping of two image domains are jointly trained with a network called discriminator D, which we omit in this figure for simplicity. On top of this, we extend the baseline in two points. First, we estimate depths by multitask learning. Second, we explore data augmentation strategy, which is specific to AO generation. The first point is in mass task learning. Since AO is originally computed from screen space buffers, which contain depth information, it is natural that AO and depth highly correlates with each other. So we propose to simultaneously learn from them. This is an overview of our model. We have two CNNs, G and F and they are encoder decoder network with skip connections. The upper half is similar to the baseline model. We propose another generator F for depth estimation, and we share the former part of the two networks to regularize the optimization. The second point is proposing a data augmentation method. Given an input image during training, we also obtain the ground truth AO and weaken it and multiply it with the original image to create the augmented input. The relation of the augmented AO and the original AO is shown on the light. So we randomly change the extent of AO so that the model is robust to a broad range of input. We optimize the networks according to the objective below. We have three terms in total. The first two terms are similar with the baseline and for the AO generation. The last term is for training depth estimation in our proposed method. We employ the robust relation loss used in mega depth paper. To train our RGB2AO model, we need a data set. Since there's no reasonable way to collect AO from real photos, we use synthetic data. We collected or manually created 3D scenes. Then we rendered RGB AO depth triplets by rendering each scene using Maya renderer. We obtained more than 8,000 images covering diverse range of images, including non-photorealistic scenes. We confirm the effectiveness of our proposed model using our synthetic dataset discussed in the last slide. During training and testing, we decide the image so that the large site is 384 pixels long we apply data augmentation, which is common in a lot of image recognition tasks, such as random flipping and cropping. 
We used the test subset of our synthetic data and computed the following evaluation metrics, MAE, MSE, SSIM, and LPIPF. To the best of our knowledge, there is no existing image-based AO generation method. In this experiment, we evaluated the performance of our model and compute it with the two approaches that can you be utilized in our setting. The first one is called RGB2 Depth to AO. In this approach, RGB2 Depth translation and Depth to AO translation is applied sequentially. Here we show the estimated depth using the CNN trained on our dataset. It seemed to capture the global geometry well. However, it's not enough to generate accurate AO as we will show next. Here, we show the enlarged view of the input RGB and ground truth AO image for visibility. Given this input, RGB to depth to AO produces very blurry output. In contrast, the result of our model is much better with less blur. This is uh, the other part of the image. We can see that our result is especially better at the leg of chairs. The second one is image decomposition. In Amorati's method, decomposes an input RGB image into multiple layers, including ambient occlusion. However, this is AO estimation for the time when AO is already present in the image. In contrast, our approach is for generating a DAO by inferring geometry and semantic information for the time when AO is not present. So, there is a clear difference between the result of image decomposition and our model. We are going to show the inverse details in the next slide. Given this input, the image decomposition model detects shadow that is already present. So it estimates AO at the bottom of the markup, but it doesn't estimate AO inside the markup. In contrast, our model can correctly generate AO in the both areas. The same trend can be observed in the other enlarged views. It is clear that our model can correctly detect the intersection of the floor and the door or the small gutter. In this table, we show the constative evaluation results of our model compared with two approaches that we have been discussed. The first group is for the variance of RGB to depth to AO approach, and the second group is for the variance of image decomposition approach. It is clear that our model consistently outperforms compared approaches. We also conducted an aberration study on the contribution of our proposed components, AO augmentation, and multitask learning of AO and depths. We report the evaluation metrics in the table. We can see that both of the proposed components contribute to the performance improvement. Here, we demonstrate two applications of our model. The first application is for more realistic 2D image composition. Using the generated AO, we can make the composite object look as if the car is on the load or the box is on the floor. Here, we will show that our method is complementary to deep image harmonization that matches the appearance of foreground and background region. Given an image and a mask, we first apply deep image harmonization. Then we generate AO on top of DIH result and magnify the image using the generated AO. 
Here we show the enlarged view to emphasize the difference. DIH matches the color of the cup and saucer with the surrounding table. In addition, our generated AO emphasizes the contact between the saucer and the wood table. To confirm this difference constatively, we conducted a user study. We first created a set of 26 images that covers a wide variety of real examples where some 2D objects are composited. For example, cups, cars, and chairs. Then we asked participants which look more realistic. We obtained over 70% preference rate from nine participants. Thus, our generated AO is useful for more realistic image composition. We also showed the second application, geometry area image contrast enhancement. Our generated AO can enhance the contrast of an image according to the geometry and gives a different look of the image. Our future is also applicable to non-photorealistic image. We can see that AO is correctly generated for common objects such as software and potted plants. This is another example. As a future work, we are interested in collecting more diverse data since our AO generation model sometimes fails on objects from unseen categories as shown in these figures. Here is a summary of our work. Inspired by classical 3D rendering techniques, AO, we propose to generate AO from a single 2D RGB input. We propose a CNN learned from RGB AO pairs tailored for AO generation. For example, we propose multitask learning of AO and depth and AO augmentation. Finally, we demonstrate two applications of our generated AO for realistic image composition and geometry array image contrast enhancement filter. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. This is a very great work. Um, I I'm looking if uh, some people ask questions online, but I don't see any. So I will I will go for it myself. Okay. Um, this is very interesting, and and uh, this is uh, original work that it was a very good idea to uh, to manage the ambient occlusion automatically on images because it really adds realism. Um, I'm wondering if this is something that you could control like for instance depending on the uh, lining of the image could you control the darkness of the ambient occlusion i see so, yes uh i think the answer is yes so uh we generate the uh ao but uh we can use uh for example we can use tone curve or something to uh for the for the uh, darken or lighten that generate AO so you can uh yes so say I think yeah you can control the control the uh AO to some extent if you yeah okay thanks uh, I I there, there was one question that was mm -hmm. asked on YouTube is from Claudio Mura um, can we expect good results when applying the method to images that do not exhibit a similar semantic content to the ones on the training data? Um, for instance, if I want to add AO to a rendering of simple textualized geometry, a lit with a basic local illumination model, would I get good results? So, yeah. So so it's it's a bit hard to uh, get the point. Um, if possible, could, could you could you re repeat it? It's depending. It, what 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 is the dependence of the result to the geometry of the image, the content, the the image content? Uh huh. 
Yes, uh, it's it's depend it's partially dependent because uh, we during the training training the uh, AO generation model, uh, we also uh, tr try to estimate the depth at the same time. So I uh, so we think it it implicitly uh, reflect the uh, depth information uh, to the generated AO. And is it dependent to a uh, texture or not? Or if you do not have texture, does it work similarly? Or well, <laughs> yes, maybe. Uh, yeah, we've tried a bit about like textureless images. So in that case, uh, the performance is slightly worse because uh, during the during the learning. Uh, uh, we think that the most of uh, most important visual cues are edges uh, in RGBA images. So if it's totally textureless, it's gonna be very hard to <laughs> estimate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Uh, there is another uh, question from uh, uh, Luis Claudio, um, who say uh, that it is great results. Thank you. And he asked, uh, do you think this could replace Queen Space AO in, um, in real time rendering tasks? Well, so our task is for to generate AO from RGB image. And if you have an screen space information like jet buffer, depth, normal, or something like that, uh, it's <laughs> uh, actually there's a, another paper called Deep Shading in EGSR. Uh, they use they trained a model uh, to find the mapping between the screen space buffers and the output AO. So yeah, maybe that work would be much, much more <laughs> similar to the question. So our work is for generating AO from RGB input, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I don't see any more questions. So thank you for this great talk. This, this thank is you. Really, really nice work again. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we got, we're going now to, uh, to the next paper on the single sensor compressive uh, light field video camera. The authors are Sagi Aji Sharif, Asian Manji, Christine Gimo, and Jonas Anger. And the presenters here online are Sagi Aji Sharif and Asian, Asian Manji. Hello, my name is Sagi Aji Sharif from Linköping University. And I'm going to talk about our work on single sensor compressive light field video camera. This work has been done as a collaboration between Linköping University and INRIA in Rennes. There are a variety of techniques for capturing the angular information in a scene. For instance, by using multiple cameras as this set up by the Stanford University. Or by placing an array of macro lenses in front of an ordinary 2D sensor as it has been done in Lytro and Raytrix cameras. However, multi-sensor cameras lead to bulky, expensive and impractical setups why micro lens approaches sacrifice the spatial resolution for the angular resolution. Another design which is similar to what we have used in this work is coded aperture. By simply placing a non-random mask placed between the sensor and the aperture plane, we can capture light fields with high spatial and acceptable angular resolutions. Unlike lenslet arrays design, this design does not suffer from the trade-off between the spatial and angular resolution. We present a novel framework for recovering full resolution light field videos from the coded aperture measurements using compressive sensing. Similar to previous methods, we employ coded aperture design where color-coded mask with random transmittance is placed in front of the sensor. This mask is randomly moved before capturing a frame. We do this to assist the reconstruction algorithm by increasing the incoherence between the measurements of the different frames. 
We extend our construction model by including the temporal information in the light field. Our dictionary is trained on a small set of consecutive frames and utilizes the sparsity in the spatial, angular, spectral, and temporal domains simultaneously. We propose a novel sensing model design that is suitable for this setup, which explores the temporal coherency in the reconstruction. Previous works on compressive light field imaging has been to use the sparsity in the spatial angular domain of the dictionary, as it has been used by Marvo et al. in their work. They use a monochrome coding mask in front of a CFA-enabled sensor. They also built a pro prototype of this design in their work. Mianji et al. showed that by including the spectral domain of the light field information in the dictionary, a better recovery of light field can be achieved. They also showed that the framework benefits from using a color coding mask instead of a monochrome mask. In our work, we considered a single sensor design for capturing the light field by using a color coding mask that is placed between the sensor and the aperture and moves randomly from one frame to the next one. The mask interpolates the five-dimensional light rays into a single 2D coded image. We reconstruct the light field using a data-driven dictionary where we consider all dimensions of the light field, which uh, are spatial, angular, spectral, and temporal domains. To test our proposed sensing model, we consider two designs, a monochrome sensing uh, sensor design where a color coding mass is placed between the sensor and the aperture, and where a CFA-enabled sensor design where we also add a color filter array between the color coding mask and the sensor. In compressive sensing, we sample a signal X using a sampling mask, which is usually a random mask, and here we show it by psi to get our measurements by hat. Compressive sensing states that if the signal is sparse or if we can find the domain where the signal is sparse in it, we can use fewer number of samples than what is required by the Nyquist rate for acceptable recovery of the signal. Therefore, if we learn a representation where x is a sparse in it, such as dictionary D, and plug this representation in our sampling equation, we can compress the light field on the sensor during capturing. We can solve this linear problem by finding a suitable sparse vector s, um, which is the sparse coefficients, to recover our signal x. In this work, we explored several sensing models in order to find the one that is best for our application. The first sensing model, that we called SM1, is based on training a single frame dictionary, meaning that the dictionary only includes a spatial, angular, and spectral information of the light field and we stack the sensing matrices and the measurements of each frame in a matrix vertically. This way of arranging the information vertically increases the number of available samples, and therefore it increases the sparsity and incoherence of the data. Here are some results of the sensing model 1, which is shown in the middle. On the left is a result of the paper of Mianji et al., where they use the same dictionary as we do in their sensing model. However, in our model, we use the information from three consecutive frames, and as you can see, the objects in the backgrounds that are stationary are reconstructed quite well, whereas the reconstruction of the moving objects, like the yellow region in the bottom row, has failed, since we do not use the temporal coherency in our trained dictionary. Another sensing model that we explored was sensing model 2, where we used multi-frame dictionary learning method, where we also include a few consecutive frames of the training set to train our dictionary. However, unlike previous sensing model, we stack our sensing matrices horizontally, which leads to interpolation between the consecutive frames and therefore decreases the sparsity. 
Here, multiplication of psi and x1 is our measurement y. And if you continue this multiplication between these two vectors, you end up uh, interpolating between the measurements. Here is the result of this proposed sensing model with respect to the first sensing model and the method of Mian et al. As you can see, including temporal information has improved the result of the moving objects slightly, but it is still performs poorly since our number of samples are not enough for recovering the signal correctly. Finally, we ended up with sensing model 3, where we combined the benefits of the previous two sensing models. This means we combined multi-frame dictionary learning approach and we stacked the sensing matrices and the measurements vertically. In this way, we used the temporal coherency encoded in our trained dictionary and we also have enough samples for the reconstruction. In this sensing model, we recover beta frames of the light field for the reconstruction of each frame. Here, beta is the size of the temporal window. To create a suitable format for our captured data, we stack frames such that the frame that we want to reconstruct is placed at the center. Imagine if we have five frames of the measurements of the light field that has been captured with our simulated camera and we want to reconstruct frame number two. Let's assume that our beta is three, meaning that we use three consecutive measurements for the reconstruction of each frame. For the corner cases, such as frame one, where we don't have enough measurements yet, we use the measurements from, from frame one and frame two, and then we recover two light fields for each frame. For the reconstruction of frame 2, we stack frames uh, 1, 2, and 3 measurements and we recover a light field for each of these frames. We continue this process for the next frame and we recover more light fields, and so on. As you can see, we end up with 3 estimation of light field for each frame and we average over these estimations to calculate our final light field for that frame. Here are some results with sensing model 3. As you can see, we have recovered both the stationary, stationary background objects and the moving foreground regions quite well. We tested our proposed algorithm on two capturing design. The first one is a monochrome sensor design. As you can see, our method performs much better in terms of PSNR and SSIM when compared to the other previous state-of-the-art methods. The other methods do not explore different dimensionality of the light field in their sensing model. This is also visible in the visual results as shown in above the table. Here is the result for the CFA grip sensor, and as you can see, we achieve uh, about 6 dB higher in PSNR than compared to the other state-of-the-art methods. We also compare our work with deep learning method of Inagaki et al., where they also learn the sensing movements in their network. To better show the differences of the results between the different methods, here we show the error image that has been amplified by order of 10. And as you can see, our method has far less artifacts in the reconstruction when compared to the other previous state-of-the-art methods. When we compare the results of monochrome sensor and CFA sensor, we see that in the CFA sensor, we achieve higher KSNR, and this is due to the fact that we have about three times more sample due to the color filter array that is placed in, the, in front of the sensor. Here is the result of comparison of our reconstruction algorithm on a monochrome sensor with other state-of-the-art methods. 
This is a raw coded footage from the compressive camera, and this is a reconstruction using the method of Marvel et al. As you can see, this method fails to recover the color from their measurements. This is due to the fact that they don't use the spectral domain in their reconstruction. On the left is the method of Mianji et al. that includes the spectral information in their dictionary and sensing model. However, this method still fails to recover temporal coherency and it contains temporal artifacts, as you can see in this video. On the right, you see our method, which resolves all these issues, and there is a temporal coherency between the frames of the light fit reconstruction. This is the footage of compressive measurements from the CFA-enabled sensor. Here is the reconstruction results of the method of Marvel et al. on the left and Mianji et al. on the right. Here is the of both reconstructions. On the left is the deep learning method of Inaga et al. Although they recover light field quite well, there is a special shift in their results that you can see in this error footage. Our method, on the other hand, recovers the light field with minimum error that you can see in this error footage. We explored the effect of temporal window size on the reconstruction quality by changing the window size from 2 to 5. As expected, including more frames improves the results, but the rate of improvement slows gradually. This is true for both monochrome and CFA-enabled sensors. The size of the temporal window is seen and content-dependent and should be adjusted based on that. One should note that increasing the window size increases this, uh, the computational complexity. Therefore, there is a trade-off between the quality of reconstruction and the computational time. There are some limitations of future works that we like to discuss in this part. Since the vectorized are multidimensional dictionary, the complexity and computational time grows with the size of the dictionary. To improve this, one can use GPU implementation for the optimization problem or to use multidimensional dictionary without vectorization. Another limitation of compressive sensing model methods for mass-based light field photography is that the baseline within the cameras must be relatively small. In practice, this is not a limitation since the size of the sensor does not allow for large baselines. However, to test our algorithm for reconstruction, we considered using a dataset with a larger baseline between the neighboring views. We tested our method with respect to the other state-of-the-art methods on this dataset. As you can see, there are still some artifacts in the regions where, where there is a, a shift between the views. However, we have achieved a much better reconstruction quality when compared to the other methods, both in terms of visual uh, results and in terms of the PSNR. The other limitation is considering fast-moving objects or fast camera movements. Currently, we choose our window size intuitively based on the content of the scene and how fast the camera moves. One can adopt a method to include the disparity information or optical information in the reconstruction method. To summarize our contributions, we presented a compressive light field video camera 
with a temporarily bare sensing model that increases the sparsity while it maintains the temporal coherency. This method achieves high quality reconstruction of full resolution light with video from 2D coded projections on the sensor. We showed that the effect of monochrome and color sensor on the reconstruction quality changes because there are different number of samples in each of these designs. We studied various sensing models and found a model that is suitable for reconstruction of light with videos. We also studied the size of the temporal window on the reconstruction quality. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any further questions regarding our work, please send us an email. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very nice talk and very great work. Um, I, we have a, one question from Tamas Manufer. Um, who also liked uh, the talk, he said, nice talk. Um, and the question is, do, do, did you try calculating color bleeding? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, no, we didn't consider color bleeding as it hasn't also been considered in the previous works uh, on compressive sensing, light field capturing. So we didn't consider that in our work either. Would it be a big step to consider it? I'm sorry? Would it be a big step? Would you need to do um, a, a, a full extension of, the, of your work? Or could it be slightly tuned to take uh, this into account? It, it's, it's not a big step. Uh, it's, it's quite an easy uh, everything. Uh, the camera simulation from noise to color bleeding and every characteristic of the camera sensor can be applied directly to a sensing model. It only becomes one additional matrix that we have to multiply in, uh, in the sparse reconstruction algorithm. So in terms of complexity, um, no, but we didn't consider it because we, we had to compare to previous work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question myself. Um, light field cameras are sometimes uh, used to, uh, to to make some modification of the uh, position of the cam of the uh, focus, for instance, or to move slightly around the viewpoint. Um, did you try to uh, to use these functionalities as well on your techniques? No, you can go ahead. Um. So, so can, can you repeat the question so again? Light feed, light feed cameras, they, they can be sometimes used to uh, do some refocusing or, yes. or to move around the original viewpoint. So how would you uh, approach, uh, be uh, robust with this type of uh, repositioning of a virtual camera? Yes, we, we can do that. Uh, I don't know if you had examples of that in the video, but... Uh, it's focusing. yeah you can definitely it's it's just as as you as you can do it with any other type of light field data set you can do this with uh, with our data sets too and and the quality will be increased because of your approach uh yeah because we have this temporal coherence uh, among the frames so if you do it with previous methods uh, if you look at a single frame, yes, it might look fine, but if you look at a video, they, they, uh, they typically fail. Okay, well, um, I don't see any of the questions from the audience. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for this uh, very nice work, very nice talk. Thank you. And, uh, th thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, the last paper of this session is uh, now on accurate real-time 3D gaze tracking using a lightweight eyeball calibration. Uh, the authors are Quan Wen, Derek Bradley, Tabu Biller, Sin Wook Park, Otmar Iligis, Jun Ai Yong, and Feng Shu. 
And uh, we have many authors here to, uh, with us today, so don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm sure they will be uh, answered very accurately. It's a great pleasure to present our work, Accurate Real-Time 3D Gaze Tracking Using a Lightweight Eyeball Calibration. This work is done by Tsinghua University, Disney Research, and ETH Zurich in cooperation. Estimating the 3D gaze of a user can be used to guide target selection in HCI, assisted reaching and grasping in robotics, and eye capture and retargeting in computer graphics. With the development of technologies, monocular images alone can be used to estimate the user gaze. Many of them focus on determining the 2D gaze angles or the point of regard on a 2D display. The task of estimating 3D point of regard is much more challenging. Some techniques require special recording systems like near-eye hand-mounted trackers. Others are able to directly perform the task with camera, but they require some high-end calibration equipment to infer some unobservable and person-dependent eyeball parameters. Embracing these challenges, we propose a novel gaze vergence based approach to track the 3D gaze of users in real time. In this method, we aim at the tracking of 3D point of regard by monocular RGB frame in a convenient manner. To estimate the user-specific eyeball parameters, we propose a lightweight eyeball calibration scheme which requires only a short face video of the person, but not any additional equipment. Then with the calibrated parameters, we propose a virgin-based model fitting method to achieve the tracking of 3D point of regard in one RGB frame. Here's an overview of our method. In the first stage, our lightweight calibration procedure requires the user to focus on one 3D target point in the scene with some arbitrary head poses. It doesn't require the knowledge of the exact 3D position of gaze targets and thus more feasible for end users compared to previous work. Then the calibration method estimates the person-dependent parameters including the eyeball radius, iris size, and the offset of visual and optical axis. The face tracking module helps to estimate the eyeball position relative to the head and locate the eyeball in 3D space. In the second stage real-time gaze tracking, we still employ the face tracking to locate the 3D eyeball in one frame. Then given the calibrated parameters, we propose a model-based eye gaze tracker optimized with the virgins constraint. The two gaze vectors are constrained to intersect at a vergence point and thus allows for the tracking of 3D point of regard. Our tracking system runs at an interactive rate of 29 frames per second. It's projected color into the images. For the geometry component, we approximate the eyeball with a sphere of radius r. The eyeball center PE is defined with respect to the coordinate of the head. The iris is approximated by a single circle centered at pupil PP and with a size defined by an angle psi. Oftentimes, the optical axis is considered to correspond to the gaze direction. But actually, the gaze direction is collinear with the visual axis, is not aligned with the optical axis, but originates from the fovea at the back of the eye as described by Barrett et al. So in our model, the visual axis originates from the pupil center and deviates from the optical axis by kappa degrees. We further model kappa with a symmetric polar angle kappa theta and an anti-symmetric azimuth angle kappa phi as shown on the right. In addition, as mentioned before, when the person is looking at a 3D point in space, the visual axis have to intersect at this point. It's defined as the virgin's constraint, 
and used in the estimation of eyeball rotations and 3D gaze. To represent the appearance of the eyeball, we employ the model proposed by Wen et al. It simply used two intensity values to model appearance of the iris and the sclera. The intensities of them are estimated from the image using a Gaussian mixture model, and they are updated at every frame to fit the lighting changes in the scene. Then we leverage the eyeball model in our calibration and gaze tracking, which aim to recover suitable eyeball parameters from input images. Some parameters remain fixed for a given person and only require to be estimated once, such as the eyeball radius, the eyeball position in the head, the angular offset of visual axis, and the iris size. Others like the eyeball rotations might change over time and thus require to be estimated continuously. We refer to the estimation of the fixed parameters for each user as eyeball calibration. In our calibration, the user is asked to focus on a specific yet unknown point in the scene and move the head around while maintaining focus. In this case, all the visual axes in these images intersect at one 3D point. This provides strong constraints for the user-specific eyeball parameters and also the position of that 3D point. So our method can achieve eyeball calibration without the ground truth position of the calibration point. To be specific, with all these images collected, we solve for the user-dependent eyeball parameters. The first constraint here is the photometric consistency. It means that in each calibration frame, the projected 3D eyeball should match the 2D eyeball in the image. The red circles here visualize the projected boundaries of 3D irises. So when projecting the 3D eyeball into the 2D image, the intensity CGA of a vertex J should match the image intensity at the projected location. CJ is determined by the aforementioned appearance model. The second constraint here is the divergence constraint. The two visual axes of the left and right eyes in one frame should intersect at the 3D point of regard. The norm here computes the minimum distance of two rays. In our calibration, it measures the distance of the two visual axes. As mentioned before, in all the calibration frames collected, the 3D point of regard remains constant. The visual axis of both eyes in all frames have to intersect at the target location. So the gaze vergence in one frame can be extended to a constraint with respect to any two frames. In general, the energy to be minimized in the calibration has two parts. One measures the photometric consistency in all frames, and the other constrains the gaze vergence in every pair of two frames. In practice, we are not limited to a single target point, but can ask the user to sequentially focus on a set of different scene points omega, yielding a set of frames f omega per target point. We jointly minimize this overall energy over both the set of time invariant parameters mu and time variant parameters tau. It means that we get the time invariant user specific parameters and the time varying per frame eyeball rotations. Then, in the online gaze tracking, the time invariant parameters of the user are fixed and we estimate the time varying eyeball rotations for each frame and then compute the 3D gaze direction and 3D point of regard. The energy to be minimized here is also a composition of the photometric consistency and the gaze vergence constraint. In addition, due to the approximations in our eyeball model, the gaze estimation exhibits some systematic errors. Here's an example of the azimuth muscle angle of the estimated gaze and its error. We find similar slanted distributions for different persons shown by different colors in this figure. So we propose to address this systematic error via a data-driven correction scheme. It attenuates the systematic error 
leading to a mostly zero mean distribution of the residuals and thus improves the estimated gaze. In details, we employ a linear regression that outputs a gaze correction vector. It is stable, generalizes well, and fits the need of real-time use cases. From the experiments, we find that this systematic error is highly correlated to the head translation and the gaze itself. So we select them as the input of the regression. And we find that the data-driven gaze correction is largely user-independent. It allows us to train the regression offline and to use it for entirely unseen users. Next, I will show some results. The first one is a comparison of different solutions of gaze tracking. The eyeball calibration plays an important role in our gaze tracking. It reduces the average error of the nine subjects from the blue bars 8.5 degrees to the orange bars 4.2 degrees. The gaze regression further reduces the error to 3.5 degrees shown by the gray bars. In addition, we train and test a state-of-the-art CNN-based gaze tracking method on our self-collected dataset. The average error is 4.6 degrees, 24% higher than our 3.5 degrees. Then we demonstrate our 3D gaze tracking method with some potential applications. Due to the versions constrained in our method, we are able to track the 3D point of regard. The estimated 3D targets are visualized at red points in two additional views. We can see that, despite the difficulty of this task, our tracking works well a bit with some jitter. We also measure the tracking errors of the 3D targets, and the average Euclidean error is about 80 mm, presented by the gray bars here. While this error is not negligible, please note that Without our proposed divergence constraint, the two eyes gaze rays are not guaranteed to converge to a single 3D point. Even small errors in estimating the visual axis can lead to very large errors in the estimated depth or z-value of the triangulated gaze target. About 80% of the target errors come from inaccurate depth estimation, shown by the yellow bars here. In addition, we show two sequence results of 3D gauge retargeting. The current automatic solution gives visually pleasing results, which can serve as a good initialization for animators to generate vivid facial animations. Here's the second result. The 3D target is used to drive the gaze of multiple 3D characters in the same scene as the actor, demonstrating an AR application. Finally, let me conclude this work. We propose a real-time 3D gaze tracking technique using a single RGB imagery only. First, we propose a novel lightweight eyeball calibration method which does not require known 3D positions of the calibration targets. Leveraging the calibrated parameters and the two constraints, we propose an online gaze tracking method and a linear regression to reduce systematic errors. We show experimentally that our technique yields high accuracy in gaze estimation, better than a state-of-the-art appearance-based method and we demonstrate visual results on 3D gaze target tracking and apply our technique to gaze retargeting with visually pleasing results. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. This, this is really, really nice work. And it seems to work very well. So we have uh, one question from Marco Argus um, that asked uh, that first say that it was very good work, and now and ask how sensitive is the measuring error with respect to the distance i to the object? 
Um, well, uh, I think in our experiments, uh, we we ask the users or the participants to sit at a distance of half a meter in front of the camera, and I think this is a common distance when we use a uh, uh, camera-based applications. And um, so uh, I think uh, mostly the, the target error is very uh, sensitive to the to the distance um, because. Um, because we know that uh, the, the gaze angles are uh, intersect at the target position, and uh, and we show in the presentation that um, it's very sensitive to the to the depth of the of the target point to the to the face. So um, uh, I think because the the target uh, tracking is not very accurate now and. We must uh, improve the the gaze tracking to uh, improve the the accuracy of the gaze angles, and then we can have uh, more accurate targets uh, tracking. Um, so I think the target tracking is now very sensitive to the to the distance. Okay, thank you. Um, there there is another question from Naoto Inui. Uh, how robust is the method under different illumination condition of the environment? Um, I think we can uh, we can handle the, the illumination to some degree because um, we use a, a simplified binarized appearance model in our algo model, and um, of course, it's a previous uh, previous work of our of uh, is our previous work. And we estimate uh, the the colors of the sclera and uh, and the iris uh, from the image uh, from the eyeball pixels in the image. Uh, so we have considered the the illumination of the of the eyeball in the three image uh, in that appearance model. So uh, actually, we have handled these illumination conditions. Uh, in the gaze tracking, um, well, yeah, That's including highlights, including highlights that could be uh, visible on the eye. Um, well, in in our previous work, we have considered highlight, but in this one, I think we we didn't uh, specially model the highlights in the appearance model, but uh, because it's a photometric error based uh, method, and uh, I think. Um, in most cases, the photometric error is stable and can handle some highlights in the eye region. But if the if there are too many big highlights in the eye region, I think our method is not not so robust. Um, I I I don't see any other question from the audience. Um, I I do have a question. Um, how fast is it to uh, uh, to pick up the the gaze again? Because you seem to be in very controlled condition, and your user is not blinking. So, what what happens when blinking? Do you recover easily the uh, the eyeball position and uh, and the gaze? Um, let me see. Um, um, I think we. We didn't specially consider the blinkings because um, uh, when the blinking happens, we we have no eyeball pixels in the image, and uh, because you know we are a photometric error-based method, and um, so um, I I think we 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 didn't do very well in the. Uh, in the recovering of the eye gaze, like some other method or some uh, commercial eye trackers. Um, so, well, we, we, we can consider that in later, I, I think, in future works. So yeah. future, future work, okay. Yeah. And uh, one last question. Um, on the error you have from one user to the other, um, is it also due to the uh, difference of the uh, eyeball uh, size? Because I, I think that all humans don't have the same eyeball size. Did you consider that the center of the eyeball may be a bit different because the, the eyeball have a different size? 
Um, could you could you repeat the question or, or uh, Derek? Sorry, sorry. Um, the, yeah. it seems that your model um, is trying to find the center of the eyeball, uh, but yeah. users have a different eyeball uh, radius, and maybe yeah. uh, you could have um, an error that is linked to this, but um, you didn't speak about it, so maybe it's not relevant. I'm not sure. Um, well, we have uh, we have calibrated, uh, I think, approximated eyeball size in the in the calibration. So uh, the the eyeball size and the eyeball position in the head are all parameters we need to calibrate it. But we we don't have the ground truth uh, values of these parameters because they are they are unseen values uh, in a human's head. So I think um, finally we have. Uh, we have some suitable parameters for the finally for the final gaze tracking. So um, I think to some degree these parameters calibrated are are accurate, but we we I have no idea how accurate they are. Um, yeah. So it's probably taken into account by your regression uh, system, probably. So you yeah, um, because we, we have many approximations in our whole pipeline, so we we have a uh, approximation of the eyeball shape, and we have some maybe um, inaccurate head poses, uh, head poses estimations. So we find some systematic errors in the final uh, final gaze. So we from the experience experimental results, we model them as a regression to. Uh, reduce the systematic errors to some degree, but for the really reason of the real reason of the, the errors, we, we have to uh, collect all the ground truth values of the intermediate parameters and to do some more accurate analysis. But yeah, but that that uh, that are not uh, included in our work now. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one last question, uh, if you still have time for that, uh, from Gustav Waldemarsson, who says, the method seems a bit temporarily unstable. Is that something that you're working on correcting? Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, I think this question is from the, 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 the target uh, visualizing results. Um, we have shown in the presentation. Um, so um, I think adding some more more uh, filters could be make the, the the whole method better. But currently we we are um, we are doing doing something that is really um, uh, on the I think that is on the baseline. Uh, just our tracking method frame to frame. Yeah, so I think some filters may may help for our tracker. Yeah, I was thinking maybe that uh, there could be something about uh, micro movements of the eyes as well, because an eye is never very fixed. Uh, as um, yeah, uh, but uh, I, I think in our uh, in our scene application scene, uh, and we use a web camera to capture the eye movement. So I I have I I have uh, watched the frame frame to frame in a video, and I I think it's hard to distinguish the micro movement okay. uh, in such a setting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any any more qu uh, question from the audience. I'm gonna check again. No, I don't see any. Um, so. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation, for this very nice work. And uh, um, so uh, let's applaud uh, virtually all the authors of these sessions that really did a, a very good work uh, and presented very nice papers. And uh, this, uh, this is now closing the, the session on images and videos. Thank you, everyone.